old-fashioned cures. Old-fashioned cures. My mother and my grandmother's specialties were old-fashioned cures, and I was their favorite patient. <laughs> Once when I was about 10 years old, and I had a bout of insufferable influenza, uh, I had not been to school in almost a week because of the fever, and I had not slept during a lot of that time because of my cough and congestion. I made the mistake of just hinting that maybe it was time for me to go to the doctor. <laughs> the two great women in my life said, nonsense, we can heal you. And so they went back into the kitchen and started into their work. I swear, I think they were laughing. So as I sat there in this chair in the living room, uh, my mother was the first to emerge. And in her hand was a little cloth bag. And in the cloth bag was, was a freshly minced white onion. And she had tied that bag with a, uh, with a, a piece of twine and she ceremoniously hung it on my neck. And she said, son, this onion bag will cure your cough. And I said, yes, ma'am. Well, my grandmother was a little longer. I mean, in fact, she was back there in the kitchen for, for extended time. And I think she was singing. And when she emerged, she had this, um, this old dish towel, which she had folded over in almost a square. And in it were all sorts of herbs and spices, lots of lots of ground mustard and other oils and she came out she she took off my shirt and plopped that thing right on my naked chest right here she said your congestion will quickly go away and I said what you said to your Alabama grandmother yes ma'am well, I'm here to testify to the fact that the onion bag did absolutely nothing for my cough. But it did have me crying throughout the entire night. <laughs> As for the mustard plaster, uh, it didn't, it didn't uh, do a thing for my congestion. However, it did leave me with second degree burns <laughs> in a four by six rectangle which it literally took me months to heal from the next morning I went to school <laughs> I thought that was the only escape and I can still hear my mother and grandmother congratulate the, congratulating themselves doctors who needs them I didn't have the heart nor did I have the courage to tell those two women who raised me that their old home remedies, their old, their old cures just didn't work. Their medicine could not make me well. The old medicine could just not make me well. And this is essentially what Jesus says to the man who approaches him. This attorney who comes up and asks, what must I do to get eternal life? And due to that question, Jesus launches into the well-worn, well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. But I want to forewarn you that we have domesticated that parable beyond all recognition. This is a parable that bites. It bites hard. And we have turned it into a moral yarn or into a civic lesson. And I can testify to you that Jesus didn't give moral and civic lessons. Instead, he issued invitations to the kingdom of God. So, this attorney approaches Jesus. And he asks, what, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Now, to be clear, this lawyer or this attorney was an expert in the Torah, in the law, in the first five books, the books of Moses. He was an expert in that. So quite naturally, Jesus, when he asked him this, says, well, you tell me, you're the expert. What does, what does the Torah say? What does the law say? And the man, without taking much of a breath, quotes uh, Deuteronomy 6, uh, the heart of the Torah, 
Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and spirit. And then he tags on to that Leviticus 19. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is, seems to be satisfied with this, nods and says, you've answered rightly. Go and do this and you will live. And you will live. But then, then the parable takes a bootleg. The man, wanting to justify himself, says the scripture, ask Jesus this additional question. Well, um, just who is my neighbor? Now, I know myself, and I know a bunch of you, and if we ask a question wanting to justify ourselves, we're not asking a question at all, are we? No, when we ask a question wanting to justify ourselves, we already have the answer. When you ask a question to justify yourself, you're already, what you're really saying is, I've already met the limits of this, haven't I? I've already fulfilled the requirements. So when the man says, who is my neighbor, Jesus, well, Jesus answers this way. There once was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And with that first sentence, that man should have been looking for the nearest creek because it's going to burn worse than one of my grandmama's mustard plasters. <laughs> There once was a man, let's say he was a traveling salesman, going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And if you haven't been to the Holy Land, you'll know that it is a pretty steep, it's a pretty steep drop. And it was a road known for all sorts of maladies. Well, this man, this traveling salesman, goes around a blind turn. And who's waiting on him but a bunch of, bunch of thieves, a bunch of robbers. And they attack him, take all of his goods, they strip him naked... They beat him and maul him within an inch of his life and leave him beside a ditch, bleeding out. That's the state we had this man in. But don't worry. Don't worry, says Jesus. The Calvary's on their way. That was a horse, by the way. <laughs> See, you can't get that in the Presbyterian church. You can't get the, you can't get the horse part, you know. Um, anyway, the Calvary shows up. A priest shows up. And uh, they say, oh, good, this is great. You can just hear the bystanders going, oh, boy, thank goodness. But the priest shows up, sees the man over there by the ditch bleeding out, and goes to the other side of the road and exits rather quickly. Oh, boy, this thing's taking a dark turn. Oh, wait a minute, never fear, a Sunday school teacher comes around the bend. A Sunday school teacher. And that Sunday school teacher shows up, and you say, oh, surely this person will help. But the Sunday school teacher sees the man by the ditch bleeding out and also goes to the other side of the road and, and exits the area as fast, as fast as he can. Oh, can this story get any worse? Well, yes, it can. Because who shows up now but a dastardly, despicable, ultimate outsider, Samaritan. And what does he do? What does he do? Well, the scripture says his heart went out to the man by the ditch. And the Samaritan, the despicable one, the outsider goes over and stops the bleeding, puts wine and oil on the, on the wounds to disinfect them, takes the man, puts him on his own animal, takes him to town, pays for his for his medical attention and his housing and says, I'll come back and pay the rest of it later. <sighs> Story's crazy. And so then, here endeth the parable, Jesus looks at the lawyer and says, well, who was a neighbor to this guy? And the lawyer goes, um, uh, well, I, I guess the one who, who showed mercy. And Jesus tersely says, well, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Well, I don't want to, yeah, I do really. I do want to surprise you. Um, we, have, we have taken this parable and all of our enlightened, woke selves, uh, we, have, we have turned it into something it's not. First of all, the law, neither the lawyer nor the bystanders listening to this to this parable would have been a bit surprised, not one bit surprised, that the, the priest and the Sunday school teacher, the Levite, sees the man bleeding out and goes to the other side of the road. They wouldn't have been surprised by that at all. 
two chapters from Leviticus 19, Leviticus 21. Leviticus 19, of course, reads, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Leviticus 21, it says, if a priest or someone who works, works in, 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 uh, in, in religious services, basically, sees a dead body, they must separate themselves lest they become unclean. Even if the dead body belongs to your mom or your dad, look it up yourself. That's how it reads. So the priest and the Levite, they don't want to get close to, to the dead body or the body that's dying because it'll make them unclean, unfit for religious services. I mean, even if it was their mom or dad, they're not supposed to attend. Okay, that's, that messes with our modern sensibilities, but that's, that's fact on the parable. Now, the next part, you've got to imagine you're, you're, in a, you're in a movie house, or as we say in Alabama, a picture show, okay? Imagine you're in the picture show, and I'm doing this for Carissa Fenton. You imagine you're watching a Star Wars movie, all right? Could anything be better than that, Carissa? No, not really, yeah. Yeah, so you're watching a Star Wars movie, and it's been great. You know, it's been all light and stars and bravery and, 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 and beautiful, beautiful heroines and, and handsome heroes, but all of a sudden, everything changes. You can feel it. The light changes the mood changes, even the music changes to something like this. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, try getting that in the Lutheran church. All right, here you go. <laughs> anyway, anyway, in comes Darth Vader. In comes Darth Vader, the Samaritan. I mean, Darth Vader is the vilest of the vile. Okay? Well, that's, that would have been the people's assessment, the people's assessment of a Samaritan. How could you get lower? He not only had adulterated the, 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 the religion of Israel, he had been a traitor to them. Therefore, any self-respecting, uh, God-fearing Jew, if he was going from Galilee to Judah, would always go around the whole area of Samaria, just not to have to get close to any of them. Jesus would go right through, but most people would not. And so in comes a Samaritan, and it's unfathomable, really, to the people that he would be the one who goes and attends. Not only he attends to the guy who's bleeding out, not only adequate, adequately, but he does so abundantly. Right? He says, I don't care what it costs. Whatever it costs, I'm going to make sure I pay for it. Whoa, 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 whoa. This thing has taken a weird turn. Well, it's going to get weirder. Because I hate to tell you. No, I love telling you this. <laughs> We're not the good Samaritan in the story. I don't care how many hospitals, clinics, nonprofit agencies... Ministries or laws are named after the Good Samaritan. We're not the Good Samaritan. We're not. We don't get that job. No, we're the person bleeding out in the ditch. That's who we are in the parable. The person dying in the ditch. That's you and me. And the old cures just aren't working for us. They're not working. They're embodied in the parable by the priest and the Levite. That old, those old time cures, that old time religion is not working. It's not happening. And so there we are. And those things just pass us by while we're, all the life is ebbing out of us. No, no, our cure has to come from outside. The ultimate outsider. The Samaritan. The only one that can be the good Samaritan in this parable is Jesus himself. Our healing comes from Christ alone. You do know that, right? Our healing comes from Christ alone. Only the outsider can make you and me well. That's the only avenue. The only one. Everything else ends up being a dead end. Remember the lawyer's question. What do I have to do to get eternal life? Now, as... All the clergy have told you uh, here at Christ Church over and over again. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's not a whole lot of interest 
in life after death. That's not the main emphasis of eternal life in the New Testament, nor the Old, when it is mentioned, rarely. No, no, eternal life means to be in the relationship the lawyer describes from the Torah, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, spirit, and strength, and to be able to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the quality of eternal life. It's to live life in a different plane. It's to live life in intimacy with God. It's to live life the way it was supposed to be lived. The problem is we stink at it. We're terrible at loving God. We'll make, we'll make a, a grand decision. I am going to be faithful to God. And within two hours in our work day, we've already gone over to lesser gods, haven't we? And I tell you what, I'm going to be the best husband around. Hush, K. <laughs> or I'm going, to be a great, I'm going to be a wonderful granddaddy or grandmama. I'm going to, but then... As soon as, you know, everything's sweetness and light as well as, as, as long as things are going well. But when they turn south, oh, my Lord, have mercy. We stink it up. That's because we have to have the mercy from the outside. Remember Jesus telling him? Who was a neighbor? The one who showed mercy. Who shows mercy? Christ alone. Christ is the one who shows mercy and heals us and stops the bleeding. This is not bad news. This is great news. Because when the one from the outside gets a hold of you and me, when he gets a hold of us and saves us and inhabits us, we're able to do those things. But not until. We're absolutely immobile, incapable of doing any of those things. We'll just get frustrated. But our Lord is faithful. He's true. And he will. He will come to us. Bleeding out wherever we might be. Interesting image, isn't it? The life just ebbing out of us. That's not the way the Lord wants us to live. He wants us to live abundantly, full of life. And so he comes to us. He comes. Naked, bleeding, unattractive. To make us his own. I wish I'd say I made this up myself. You know, I kind of came to me in a night vision. That would not be true. If it were true, I would have a TV show and big hair. <laughs> <clears throat> that was pretty good, wasn't it? You know, I see Jack Sheffield back there. You're never going to have big hair, Pat. Uh, but um, <clears throat> anyway, what do you do when you're out on the evangelistic trail? Do you tease yours up or something, Jack? I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway... St. Paul, the earliest writer in the New Testament, was in a prison in Ephesus. He was in a prison in Ephesus, which is on the western coast of Turkey. And while he's there, he has a prison mate by the name of Epaphras. And Epaphras begins to tell him then, and later on in a letter, begins to tell him about this wonderful commu young community of Christians 100 miles inland in a place called Colossae. He says, really, the spirit is alive there. Lives are being changed. I can feel it. He says, but we do have a couple of problems. He said, our people are somewhat enamored by the stars. They still want to kind of tell their future by the stars. He says, also, we tend to go into very, very strict ascetical practices. We kind of fast like, you know, we'll fast until we almost starve ourselves. We'll stay awake for days at a time in order to pray. And he says, you know, we just kind of go nuts over that stuff. And Paul writes a letter to Colossa. He'll never go there himself. He, he never gets there. But he writes a letter to these folks. And he commends them for their faith. He commends him. Hi. <laughs> you are really cute. Uh, uh, he commends them for their, for their faith. But then he begins to tell them that these detours are obscuring the truth of their real, uh, of their real answer. I mean, okay, there's nothing monumentally wrong with looking up at the stars. I mean, how, who, uh, who, which one of us hasn't been in the newspaper right by the funny papers, right by the puzzles? <laughs> Right in the top right corner. Uh, how many of us have not looked at our horoscope from time to time to see, is this a good time to ask her out on a date? Or I guess today I'd ask, is this a good time to ask for Kay's forgiveness? Uh, but, um, 
Uh, or is this a good time to apply for a job or something? It's kind of harmless. And of course, we've had people like Gene Dixon and Nancy Reagan kind of lead us in those areas. Um, also, there's nothing wrong with ascetical practices, but you can go overboard on them such that they become idols. We begin to think we actually can make ourselves more attractive to God by these, by these practices. And this is what Paul says. It's a very, very, very powerful statement he makes, one of his most memorable. He writes to the people in Colossae and he says this. Do you not know that God has rescued you from the dominion of darkness and he has transferred you to the kingdom of his son where there is redemption and forgiveness of sins? Do you not know you've, God's rescued you from the dominion of darkness and he's transferred you to the, to, to the kingdom of his son where there's redemption and forgiveness of sin. See, what I would say to, your, to you as I say it to myself, we don't need to try harder. We just need to apply for a transfer. It's time to apply for a transfer. With that in mind, when I wrote this sermon seven days ago, I uh, wrote a prayer for myself and for all, all of us, really. So, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, I've tried everything to draw closer to you, and I've fallen flat on my face in a ditch. No matter how athletic, how aggressive, how determined I am, the old cures just don't cut it. I make a promise to love you, and within an hour or two, I've moved on to other gods. What's just as bad is that I can never seem to love the people you've given me. So I hurt, and then I hurt them. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm giving up the old medicine, and I'm asking you to pour your mercy all over me and heal me. Make me yours forever. Amen. Please stand.